few people coming in, of course. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, if you don't know, most of you know me, I'm sure already. But uh, if you don't, I'm Shane Phillips. I'm the CEO of the Phillips Group. And uh, we specialize in board and uh, CEO placements. And um, we're very proud to be bringing you this event in a partnership with Hakama, the Institute of Governance, which is really the gold standard for board best practices uh, across the region. And um, we are we created this event so that we could talk about what boards should be doing around driving profitability within their assets. And so we have a very nice lineup of speakers for you um, this, uh, this day. So of course, uh, our first speaker, uh, we have Fadi Gandur, the chairman of WAMDA. We have uh, Ellie Simon, who's co-founder of All Token Sports and the former CEO of uh, Sun Microsystems. We also have Her Excellency Nadia Al Said, CEO of Al Etihad Bank. Um, uh, and we also have Mr. Abdullah Al Sulaimi, who's one of the founders or uh, one of the uh, original uh, proponents of driving the Saudi stock exchange and uh, was a former CEO of the Tadawal. So great uh, touch point for us in talking about um, board work across the region. And uh, of course, we have uh, Mrs. Hala Shofani, president of HVS Middle East uh, Africa uh, and South Asia. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, you can put them into the uh, chat and then uh, our group will uh, reach out. Oh, we also have... Uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf uh, Gamaldeen uh, with us as well. I think he might join a panel or two. I saw him here in the audience. Hi, Dr. Ashraf, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you, good to see you. It's I my pleasure you to be with you guys. Yeah, I know you had a really hectic uh, schedule this week, so I'm glad you got were able to squeeze us in and uh, are here with us. So uh, Dr. Ashraf is the CEO of Akama, <laughs> and uh, I think he's been... What you've been with Hakama since what two thousand and six or something like that, right? No, 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 no. It's all I've been there only for ten years. Only for ten years. Two thousand fourteen. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> two thousand fourteen. Okay, I thought from the beginning. Okay. Starting, huh? I'm just starting. Ten years. It's good. It's a good run. Um, <laughs> okay, so with no uh, no uh, further ado, I will get to introducing our first speaker. But again, if you have questions please put them into the chat box. Uh, we will uh, respond to you there and then uh, you may have a chance to ask uh, any of our speakers your questions uh, directly. Um, so our first, uh, our, it's a real honor uh, to, uh, to introduce one of our first speakers here who's really also been an inspiration to so many of us across uh, the Gulf. Uh, he's the executive chairman of WAMDA a platform that invests, nurtures, and builds entrepreneurship ecosystems across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, he, Fadi is also the founder of Aramex, one of the leading global logistics companies, where he spent the first 30 years of his work life as the CEO, building the company and making it the leading emerging markets logistics company, employing over 15,000 people in over 250 offices in 90 countries. And he took the company public twice, first on the NASDAQ, making it the first company in the Arab world to do so. Then on the Dubai financial market, he continues to be active uh, on the Aramex board. Fatty is a true serial entrepreneur in his career. He's been involved with funding, investing, launching tens of companies and nonprofits ranging from digital tech, hospitality, fitness and wellness, security, and others. Uh, he's passionate about impact and he is a, and social entrepreneurship. He's founded and chairs Ruad for Development, a private sector-led community empowerment platform that helps marginalized communities across several countries in the MENA region overcome marginalization through activism, civic engagement, education, and financial inclusion. He is also co-founded and continues to support Al Riyadi, one of the leading not-for-profit sports clubs in Jordan. Uh, he's also served on numerous boards globally, regionally, uh, as well as on educational institutions and not-for-profits. It's a real pleasure and honor to introduce the one, the only, the living legend, Mr. Fadi Gandur. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shane. You have a very generous, very long uh, introduction. Uh, but I might correct you with one thing, is that I am no longer on the board of RMX. I left uh, a couple of years ago, so. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, so he's no longer on the board. Um, 
But yeah, what a what an inspiration uh, you are, and I think you're also one of the few um, Arab leaders who always takes time to uh, share your successes and speak. I know I had the pleasure of interviewing you on when we had the radio show. I guess that would have been about ten years ago, and I always remember one thing that you said to me because I always ask, you know, how important you know is passion for the entrepreneur, and then you said to me, you know, passion uh, is like a fire; it can heat you, it can warm you. But it can also destroy you. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I was I was taken aback by the level of candor that you uh, that you had in that uh, in that interview. So, thanks yeah. again. Yeah. Um, so, of again. course, today you've warned me that you don't want to talk about uh, about Aramex. It's the last thing we'll talk about. And uh, today we're really talking about you know as a board member who you are you know one of the most experienced board members in the region who's really um, you know, hands-on in terms of driving profitability for those board members out there that that want to become uh, more active in driving bottom line results. What are the levers? What is the approach? Uh, where does the line drawn between vision strategy at the board level, and where does the where does the uh, management take over from? Uh, and so, uh, here we, uh, here we, here's the, where the discussion is today. So, um, and I think what we've seen a lot is, is, uh, we always see a difference in result when you have that kind of founder chair personality, um, which sometimes may, may cross a boundary of what maybe a, a traditional corporate governance may suggest is, you know, a lot of these, um, corporate board members Tend, tend to be a little bit more arm's length from the front line, uh, where when you're dealing with a founder chair, uh, they're generally very hands-on, might even mystery shop. You'll find them in the locations. You'll find them kind of always uh, around the assets. Um, and then we kind of feel that the founder chair delivers a higher delta. I mean, I don't necessarily have the, the, the hard uh, research to prove that, but that's kind of my gut gut feeling. What do you feel, you know, today's board members should be doing in terms of, you know, where's that line cross where now you're micromanaging and you're being too tactical versus, hey, now you're too much in an ivory tower and you're really removed from what the customer needs and, and what the business needs from a decision perspective to move forward? Well, thank you, uh, Shane. That's a very important question. Uh, I am uh, very clearly for leaving the CEO alone because he's the person responsible for executing on the strategy. Now, boards should be uh, working with the CEO, with the executive team and setting strategies uh, and then overseeing that implementation of the strategy. Now, if they want to be a little bit more involved, and they should be, I think, in terms, because they're responsible. Once, you're sit, you, once you sit on the board, you are you are responsible. You, you are responsible for the uh, ultimate performance of the company towards the shareholders, whether you're a public company or whether you're a private company. So, yes, uh, uh, I mean, the board members should be probing, should be digging deeper during board meetings and, and getting proper reporting from, uh, uh, from the CEO and from his executive team on the key indicators that the board has agreed to with the CEO in terms of the strategy and the execution of the company and and uh, getting the, the clear KPIs that have agreed on and then probing these KPIs directly with the executive team during the board meetings. And that's where uh, it is. If they have deeper questions than that, then there should be uh, a clear coordination with uh, with the CEO on 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 uh, on anything that they want to dig deeper into, uh, and uh, and they should have that uh, a, se a serious and open discussion with the CEO on these things. But for board members to go directly to uh, management uh, uh, across many levels of the organizations, I think uh, I think that confuses the the reporting lines. That confuses a lot of issues. And I am uh, as a CEO that has spent 30 years, sometimes with strong boards, sometimes with more uh, internal boards. Uh, I always felt that uh, I was responsible. I'll deliver the results if uh, uh, and I'll answer the questions and I'll bring my team 
uh, to the table uh, to be able to answer and show the capabilities and show the depth of the team, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's one side of the story. Look, um, uh, shareholding board members uh, are going to be much more involved than non-shareholding board members, right? Independent board members need to understand also when they come as independent board members, they're also doubly responsible because they were brought into the board because they are independent, because they can ask the questions and because they have to know. If you are sitting on boards because it looks good for you, if it's prestige, if it's uh, nice to sit on boards, don't. Don't do that uh, because uh, boards, uh, specifically of public companies, are, are, uh, are serious responsibilities and, and you'd better know what you're talking about, why you sit on that board, and you'd better be able to ask serious questions at the board level, not get deep, uh, deeper than that. Now, if you're telling me there is, uh, so I was also, I had retired from my job in 2012, but stayed on the board. I was the largest shareholder of, of the company, that is Aramex. I was obviously much more knowledgeable than anyone else of the board about uh, uh, about the key uh, about everything about the company. Obviously, I I knew as much as the CEO did. I knew everybody in the organization, and I was able to ask serious questions, uh, influence uh, strategy, and uh, it was my uh, uh, responsibility and my uh, um, uh, it was my right as as a shareholder to be able as a as a as an influential shareholder and the shareholder of size to ask the questions. And that, these are the key issues for you. So uh, not every board uh, looks the same and not uh, you don't act the same uh, on every board and not every board should be, uh, uh, should be a replica of another board. It all depends on who the board members, what the responsibilities are, whether they're shareholders, whether they're independent, et cetera, et cetera. But the key element here, if you are on a board that is specifically in the public space, then you have a fiduciary duty and your responsibilities becomes becomes 10 times or 100 times more multiplied than when you are sitting on a board of a friend that is in a private world and you between you and the friend it's a different story or between you and the person that chose you to be on that board uh, so that's my general <laughs> overview of how how boards act i sit on a lot of boards from micro companies small uh, uh, early stage technology companies that i invest in and I am very, very, very probing, but at the board level, at the board level, I ask questions based on deliverables, based on uh, the reporting level that I get. And, and so, uh, but my relationship is with, my, is, is with the CEO. If I go beyond the CEO of the company, then I might go to the CFO. And that would be in terms of an agreement, in terms of a discussion that happens between board members and the CEO and what sort of a relationship you would have deeper than him into the organization. You don't bypass him by secret and secret, unless you feel that there is something dangerous in the company, then, then you need to have a, a different set of discussions altogether. But business as usual, everything needs to be around a conversation. And uh, for every board meeting, how, how much prep do you think a board member should be doing? Well, the CEO has to have the responsibility of sending the material at least a week before, at least a week before, so that you come to the meeting prepared and not wait for the, uh, for the CEO to present, uh, because you wouldn't have enough time to think about the issues that are coming your way. So, uh, and uh, the pack, the material that is being sent to you should, should be agreed to. So if you're an early board member, then you need to be uh, uh, onboarded and you need to agree. Uh, anyway, boards need to agree with the CEO of what sort of, uh, of a presentation, what sort of a material do you expect when, when a board meeting happens? And so what are the KPIs? What do we compare? What to, is this, is it quarter to quarter of last year? Is it this year's quarter versus, is it Q, Q1 versus Q2? I mean, there are all sorts of indicators and, and the board and the CEO need to agree on what matters. What is it that influences the company? What is it that affects the company as it is executing on its, uh, on its strategy? And so, uh, and so when you uh, go to the board meeting, you should be prepared. You should be prepared. Otherwise, uh, uh, you are uh, you are uh, you are responsible for sure. We we often have the uh, you know 
discussion around what we do with an underperforming CEO, but we rarely talk about, you know, the underperforming board member. I mean, have you had cases where, you know, you felt board members weren't really pulling, pulling their weight, or maybe you have those board members who are more on the board for prestige, prestige rather than to fulfill could their be. fiduciary duty. Could be, could be, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are all sorts of reasons for people sitting on boards and, uh, and I'm saying, uh, specifically in, in public boards, you have to be very careful. Or if you are nominated. So if I am investing in a company, let's say uh, a, a tech company, uh, and I represent certain shareholders on that tech company's board, then I am responsible towards my shareholders to go back and report to them on the performance of the company. Otherwise, I should recuse myself and get somebody else to come and replace me on the board. I mean, it's, it's hard work. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. It is, it is really hard work, because, and you need to understand that business very well. So, but but there are certain boards also where you can have different uh, uh, different skill sets on the board. Not every board member would have the same skill set. So, some board members are good at sitting on committees, uh, audit committees, uh, uh, remuneration re committees, uh, and and uh, they complement each other. As long as there is that understanding uh, and that sort of uh, collaboration among team uh, among the board members on on that skill set and and uh, and expecting that even board members that come back to report because they head or they or they are part of audit committees they come back and report to the board just like otherwise don't take that responsibility either because again if you're sitting on an audit committee you need to know what your responsibilities are if you're sitting on a remuneration committee you also uh, should know what your responsibilities are and you should have always discussions uh, specifically on remuneration committees and and other direct uh, uh, committees that relate to the execution of of the strategy of the company with the ceo now audit committees might be a little bit hands off. You need to be much more independent from the CEO because you're auditing him effectively and auditing the CEO. And you need, again, all of these have to have processes and procedures that are clear and well-defined so that everybody knows his role and everybody ex knows what to expect from the other while sitting at the, at the board. And in terms of the committees, what, what kind of committees on when you're on running the board, what kind of committee subcommittees do you feel that you need to have in order to drive peak performance in the company yeah but look uh, i mean the audit committee is is important uh, it depends on on the business you could have uh, also uh, risk uh, uh, risk committees board banks have a different set of, of of requirements i mean their banks have central bank requirements of what you do on those boards so that's also uh, that has a regulatory and a legal process to it but uh, remuneration uh, committees uh, are important, but but not too many committees, right? So you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to sink uh, into too many committees, uh, uh, so that you become a micromanager, and the board becomes managing the company through its committees. When a board feels that it wants to do that, then the CEO is is uh, is not going to last long if he's a super or a good CEO, or or if they are too involved, then the CEO is, is really not doing his job. Right, right. And the Middle East seems to be a bit unique uh, environment in a sense that it's one of the only regions where you have this kind of multi-industry exposure, where you have uh, a chair uh, who might be involved in automotive, real estate, banking, uh, agriculture, heavy industry, um, and of course, uh, for those of us from the region that we all know so many uh, examples of the of these kind of companies. So these these board members, they come on, they generally are not going to be technocrats. They're not going to have that kind of uh, depth into uh, the business. They they will have a much more hands off approach. Um, after all, if you're not an expert in a business, you're going to you're, you're not going to naturally be into the details. So. Is this a strength where it kind of forces the board members to be more visionary, more strategic? Or, you know, is this a weakness where, hey, we're making huge decisions about resource allocation on businesses where we, we might not necessarily have the expertise to make those calls? So, look, uh, I mean, you, you also don't really need to be a deep knowledge of that business. So I sat on a board of a, of a big conglomerate in Saudi Arabia when I was still the CEO of Aramex, and I accepted to do that 
uh, one, because uh, I had a lot of respect for that group. Number two, I was I felt that I could learn there also. And number three, they brought me in for a specific, uh, and I asked, you know, you want to be a board member and you're also already busy. So I asked, why do you want me to sit on, on the board with you? What do you expect of me as a board member? And so uh, uh, for them, it was, uh, uh, you're running a 20,000 people organization, you're global. Uh, you have global experience, you, ha you understand the remuneration, you understand the recruitment of talent, you understand the retaining of talent, you, uh, you understand uh, how do you uh, take care of this, uh, of this group of people that manage, and that's the skill set that we want from you. So as a private company, if it had been a public company, I might have thought twice about it before joining, but since it was a, a most, I mean, a relatively, uh, it's a family business, like you were saying, conglomerate, had uh, multiple businesses in it. And uh, I came in because I felt I could add that value. And they expected me to add that value. And so there was a job with it, right? We're not recruiting you because you're Fadi Gandur and because you're the CEO of Aramex and because you run a public company, that's very cool. It might be look cool for our, uh, but that's not why they, why they recruited me. They recruited me because they had specific things that they were doing. They were acquiring companies and they wanted to do specific things that tapped into my uh, skill set and my capabilities and i was a sort of an advisor on the board right but a board member that has a responsibility and i would give my opinion on things i understood and i would say certain things i don't understand so i can't help you with those right at the same time i was also involved uh, in, in invited to be to sit on a board on another uh, conglomerate uh, recently maybe a couple of years ago and i said no because I felt that the job was going to be much bigger than I, uh, I am capable of giving my time for. And the, the type of business was not the business that I am going to be interested enough in, even though there are certain elements that I could have benefited them from. So that's, that's my personal experience. But what you're talking about is the family businesses that I have horizontal, they're in all sorts of different verticals across the region now. These are mostly non-public uh, uh, companies and there needs to be an agreement inside the family, inside the board, inside the investors of what to expect from people who are not internal uh, to the business. Otherwise, I would suggest to them that they bring in professionals that understand their businesses that can add value to them because they cannot know all sorts of businesses, even if they are invested in them historically because the family was invested in them, because there were opportunities during the old days, the world has changed, the competitive environment has changed, market have opened. It is, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 this part of the 21st century is, is a hyper, uh, hyper competitive market and you would need to attract really serious high caliber people to uh, to uh, to sit on your board and add value to you as a family business, right? Sure. And, so and you, uh, have, and you will have you will have most of these families have different boards for the different verticals that they own. So they are right. not necessarily always horizontal boards across. Maybe the family has a as a holding company uh, that looks at all these results in a con uh, on a, on, a con uh, on an aggregation basis. But then each segment has to have a different set of, of, of knowledge and things. That's my my understanding, and that's how, what I would suggest they do. Mm. So, uh, just a, one more question for me before we turn it over to the audience here for one or two. But vision and strategy. Um, how do you feel the role? You know, the role of the board starts and yeah. ends on the on yeah. these two elements. And what are some of the kind of approaches? Maybe also tangible elements. You know, do you run a, a strategy offsite once a year? Um, you know, what's your approach to setting vision and strategy at the so, board level? So I'm, 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 I'm always saying that the person that puts the strategy, uh, or at least the skeleton of the strategy, is, is the CEO. The CEO. It, look, again, it depends on what sort of company. Is, it, is, the, is the owner the CEO? Is it a private company? Is it a public company? I mean, there, again, we have to be careful not to say that this is an answer for all boards, but... CEOs are responsible because if you're going to tell, uh, unless you tell the CEO, where we want you as a CEO to implement this strategy, then the CEO understands that he came to be a CEO to implement a certain strategy that the board recruited him for. Otherwise, if the CEO is there, and then so it's his responsibility to actually set the motion of the strategy discussion, 
the board has to be part of that uh, discussion and the board has to eventually go deep into it, agree to it, and then tell the CEO, go implement, right? You and your team. There's always a team, obviously. And so, but but the CEO has to be really, uh, uh, really, he, he needs to feel ownership of that strategy. Unless you had agreed with him that we're recruiting you for specifically a job that is for this implementation of a strategy, then expectations are set. Again, this is all about expectations. This is all about a conversation. This is all about a discussion that gets everybody to understand why they're there and wh what are they doing there for that specific uh, uh, year, for that specific strategy, etc. Once right. a year, though, the, to answer your question, once a year. If you're uh, if you're doing too many strategies, are 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 even once a year is even too much. What, what you need to do is ag also agree what the strategy is. This is a strategy for three years. It's reviewable every uh, every uh, year. So you bring back the board and say, okay, here's what we agreed to. Here's what we delivered. Uh, uh, the market changed. We need to change that strategy here. We need to iterate here. Um, I mean, uh, everything is a, li a live a live process. The, nobody, uh, there is nothing that is set in stone in anything that you do in today's dynamic markets. Right, right. So I think we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Mazin Al Tamimi, I don't know if you're there. If you can turn on your uh, your turn on your video. I don't know, Mazin, are you there? He's uh, posted some questions there. Mazin is a uh, an avid board member himself. I don't think I can keep up with all the board uh, <laughs> positions that he's had. Uh, there he is, live. Are you in? Uh, are you in Jeddah? I'm in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Ah. Oh, well, Friday. good to see you again. And you, absolutely. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, a question is the involvement. I, I know you've answered it, but I think it's uh, being a board member is not a science. It's a it's an art. And sometimes you have to be interfering. At other times, you have to be supporting. And at sometimes you have to be aggressive. And other times, you have to be very passive. Uh, the question is, when when you have somebody like Fadi Randur sitting on your on your board, and he doesn't give you his full attention and influence on your company, I don't think Fadi Randur is doing his fiduciary responsibility towards the company that he's serving on, because. I expect to have mentoring, influencing, and guidance from him. So you as Fadi Randur, I mean, when you served on 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 Aramex, when did you know step back, step forward? That is, I think, the art of a board member. Yes, yes, yes. And 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 that's a great question, Mazin. Thank you for that. And I was very aware of that. So it was it was a concern because one, I stepped off. Uh, the CEO job voluntarily, obviously, I decided to leave the company because I felt after 30 years, uh, uh, the next generation needs to take over. I wasn't interested to run the business anymore. So again, but I was also the biggest shareholder. So my, my, I had a lot of economic uh, interest in the company and I needed to stay on the board so that I am protecting my own interest and supporting the next generation, obviously, which I had groomed. Right, the CEO that came after me had uh, I recruited him from college, right, and so he was there, and and so I needed to be very careful. So I I did step back. So I I did step back, and I did talk to him uh, uh, very clearly, and we had a long discussion. We knew each other very well, obviously. That you know you tap into me when you need me, uh, uh, off boards, but on boards I'm gonna ask questions. If you wanna do anything drastic in the company, because I was still. Uh, uh, again, the economic interest was 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 heavy uh, towards me. I was the largest shareholder, so I told him, uh, uh, as, uh, as long as you're not going through something strategically different than what has been happening or what we agree to, you're you're managing. I will not interfere. I will not ask questions. I will not breathe down your neck. But at the board at the board level, then I am responsible towards the other board members who really. With all the respect to them, they were very, very nice, very influential, very capable people, but ha they had different skill sets. And the logistics business is not an easy business, right? So you need to, there is, uh, uh, and especially a company that's 35 years old, it has intricate relationships. And so it was my responsibility to also translate to some of the board members what was happening in the company so that it was part of their education. Yeah, so, but your point is very well taken, absolutely. 
obviously obviously you knew a lot more than uh, than the other board members and so on which already puts you at an advantage towards the the other board members which is because one of one of the board protocols is all all board members should know equal information rather than one having more than the other so and that's why i call it an art not a science so, so because Specifically, Again, but, when a founder when a founder leaves, I mean that that becomes much more difficult when a founder leaves because I was very much hands on. Yeah, yeah. Allah wafak. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think our time is off. I don't know if we can take more questions. You have you have other speakers, Shane, right? So, uh, but I am available if you need me. You gotta. Oh, you have to run. Okay, I was gonna no, take no, one no, more. No, 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 no. I I was saying. I'm available for you because you have other speakers after me for respecting their own time also, but I'm available for, for questions. Okay, sure. Maybe we'll just do it. I think Mrs. Uh, Sultana here wants to uh, ask a question. So let's just get her to unmute. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shane. And um, also thank you, uh, Mr. Fadi. It was a very insightful session. And my question to you is, how does one manage bias within the board? For example, if the board includes family and relatives of the company or institution, what are some strategies one can use to navigate such politics or dynamics to be seen and heard effectively on the board? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. I, that is a, a, an absolutely important question, but if you are coming into a board, that has family members, you'd better agree very early on on how you're going to address all these issues and sensitivities. Because if you want to be uh, an effective board member and to take your fiduciary responsibilities uh, seriously, uh, then you need to be uh, uh, unbiased as an independent board member. Now, family members, uh, and again, you know, family businesses have all sorts of governance issues. Uh, I don't think we have the time to address them here, but uh, yes, there is all sorts of challenges with family businesses. Uh, I would suggest the more you institutionalize and the more you remove family members from, uh, for continuity purposes and for survivability purposes. But again, this is again a very controversial subject. We'll leave it alone. But yes, it is an issue. And, and uh, uh, as I had said before, this requires a lot of discussion among independent board members and what they are expected when, when they disagree with a board member and an owner inside the company. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, I think uh, I'd love to uh, steal more of your time, uh, Mr. Gandur, because it's uh, always nice listening to you. But I think one thing that really stands out is how committed you are to, you know, helping the rest of the little whippersnappers as we try to uh, emulate your success in any shape or form that we can. Uh, but, and you always make yourself available to share your tidbits, advice, uh, guidance. Um, and I think you gave us some good tips on, you know, making sure that as a board member that we're paying attention to the KPIs, that we're digging into those KPIs, that when we're on the board, you should be asking questions and, uh, and doing so in a transparent, candid way. Uh, if we're going to go beyond the CEO, that we need to clear that with the CEO first, and uh, and maybe if we're not talking to, maybe reach out to the CFO. Um, you're you're uh, don't want to make too many committees, uh, but obviously audit risk nomination. These are some of the the key ones that you you touched on. Uh, you also highlighted the the fact that not being an expert in an industry, you still can make a, a great contribution if the business is. Uh, uh, interests or direction vision are, are overlapping with some of the experiences you've had in the, in the past. Um, and then you highlighted uh, to us, you know, kind of the approach for setting vision and strategy and how the, the board and, uh, and the management team should pass that baton back and forth uh, as we kind of find our way to, uh, to the winning uh, result. Um, just to name a few of the things we touched on. So again, thank you, uh, so much. Hopefully, you can stay with us for our next session. But um, uh, if you will, we'll be happy to call on you for your for your insights on the next piece. But again, thank you uh, so much, and hats thank off you. to you and everything that you've done. Really, you, been sir. a pillar of the in the Middle East economy uh, as well, creating jobs and doing so much for thank everyone. You. So thanks again, uh, Mr. Gandur.
Thank you so much, Shane. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And so our next uh, our next speaker coming up is on the tech side. Uh, these gentlemen are revolutionizing uh, the way that we actually do business, the way we can uh, raise debt. So uh, I found out by inter talking to them that I can tokenize part of my business, which I didn't even know. And I think Dubai is one of the cities in the world that's allowing us to do that. So let me introduce a man who's going to be uh, giving us some insight in this. He's formerly the chief executive officer of Sun Microsystems. And uh, he is a man who's really traveled the world several times over during his career. He's brushed shoulders with presidents, prime ministers, uh, and even Putin himself at times. I think last time I met with him, uh, he was in the middle of selling a multi-million dollar painting to a prince, which I'm not supposed to mention. But he's worked from San Francisco uh, to Geneva to Dubai, and he's on the edge of the technology revolution. He's a man who is tokenizing our world and he said everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized so hopefully that doesn't include me or maybe that would be positive i'm not <laughs> sure i don't even really understand what's happening but he's gonna shed some light on it please welcome mr ellie simon probably thank you thank you shane for um such beautiful words maybe i'll um just kind of have, as a way to set it up set up the conversation but um, I think we do you have a co we you have a co speaker with you, no? No. Yes, I have uh, Thomas. So shall we introduce Thomas? him? I was going to introduce yes, Thomas, please. or you want to introduce oh, him? Please do. No, 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 no. Please do. Uh, so. Okay. So uh, he has brought a gentleman uh, from from the United States of America on the other side of the pond to give us some insight as well as to what's happening. Who, uh, oh, Mr. Thomas Cohen leads tokenization at Galaxy Digital, a digital asset and blockchain leader, providing access to the growing digital con economy. While at Galaxy, he's led the Alunity JV Euro uh, stablecoin project in conjunction with GV JV partners DWS, which is Deutsche Bank, and Flow Traders. Previously, Thomas worked on PayPal stablecoin in stablecoin strategy at Paxos, at Ripple, and on the Federal Reserve's CBDC team. Thomas holds a mechanical engineering degree from MIT and both an MDA, uh, MBA and policy degree from Harvard University. I've actually heard of that school before. Welcome, Thomas. <laughs> How are you? Thank you so much. Glad, glad to be here and, and great to meet you. Yeah, I know it's quite early there. What's the time over there? Uh, it's seven thirty, so definitely an early wake up, but but worth it. Glad glad to be able to to join the Zoom. Yes, well, thanks for making the time for us, and uh, really appreciate it. Um, and so we have a real global event here today. So, so Ali, sorry, I cut you off where you were about to uh, hmm? jump into no something there. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. No worries. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having us on stage here. It's a it's a honor. It's a and uh, we feel privileged to be invited to this uh, uh, wonderful forum. The, the point I, I wanted to bring here, and the reason why we are, we are we joined kind of this this uh, we want to participate to the uh, to this event, is to kind of uh, trigger the thought process in the board that the board of today cannot be only a board of um, with all due respect of the existing boards that are happening. Uh, we, will, we, we believe, we have the feeling that a technologist need to be on the board. And the technologist, and as Mr. Fali was mentioning, who uh, needs to ask questions, to, uh, to be here to inspire, to uh, kind of almost enlighten the board with what's going on around the planet. Because, you know, us as board members, as uh, leaders, we, do, we kind of tend to, we can try to read everything. But at the end of the day, you need to be having someone on the board who can help you guide guide you into what's the next revolution. And then what this next revolution is going to bring to you. So maybe I will give a, a couple of uh, points here. My my nickname in the industry, they call me Web1. As you mentioned, I was with Sun Microsystem. And back in the days, we were promoting the concept of internet. So I know our audience is way too young to kind of appreciate what we uh, what was happening. We were uh, cruising the world with a phone and a credit card, and we were saying, "This damn phone, right? The dummy phone, like it was the Nokia text thing, is going to and it, it will be that your connection to the 
to the world because the world would be digital. And everybody was looking at us like we were a bunch of crazy. And some people didn't. Um, and I want to salute uh, and give all our respect to Sheikh Mohammed, uh, who saw that vision, and Sheikh Alubna, who also saw this vision, and then built on the uh, uh, Dubai uh, Internet City, which was really the encapsulating what the new world will be looking at and will be looking like. And what we are having now is the second kind of type of revolution is the web three, call it this way, is all about decentralization. And what is the impact of a decentralized organization into a board, a governance? How do, how do you do governance in a decentralized organization? But before we start everything, I would like to ask Thomas to kind of set the scene. What is the, What are we talking about? What is this tokenization thing? What is it that why everybody is going that direction? What is it? Yeah, happy to happy to jump in. I feel like tokenization has over the past year or so has really become one of those buzzwords that in many ways means nothing and everything at the same time because everyone uses it in so many different ways. So easiest way that I think about it is it's really the process of issuing a token on a blockchain that digitally represents something, usually a tradable asset. Um, so I think the easiest way to think about it is it's very much like securitization except the underlying technology of securitization in this case is different. And it means that, that whatever you tokenize can move much faster. And so you have instant settlement, you have programmability, you have much fewer intermediaries. So that just means in, you know, in the case of currency, for example, for a stable coin, which is like an on-chain dollar, on-chain euro, for example, it means that it can just move instantly. And so the, the cross-border costs and, and time that it usually takes drastically cuts down. And the easiest way to think about this is before tokenization, value and information traveled in parallel worlds. So you can think about when you would swipe your credit card, you obviously are exchanging information with the, with the coffee company, but, but your actual dollars don't move until three or four days later. So of course there's that delay, which costs your stat risk and, and all kinds of, of other risks in the system. Whereas with tokenization, you're taking the value, which is the dollars, and the information, the transaction, and putting them together. So that really just means that you can move things around much faster. And that's just from a value point of view. But to your point earlier about governance, this means that suddenly, because everyone can have their voice heard via a different tokenized mechanism, that means that you can have votes and you can have inputs from people from all different parts of your organization, not just the people who are at the very, very top, because tokenization allows you to kind of democratize a lot of that, a lot of that access. Um, so at a very high level, that's kind of the way that I think about tokenization. In one sentence or so, it's a parallel between, you know, the internet really revolutionized the movement of information. Tokenization can revolutionize the, um, the movement of value. And that's really the thing that's going to unlock over the next decade or so and impact a lot of different parts of the economy. Well, so how will tokenization really impact the corporate board? Yeah, so it's one of those things that in some ways it won't at all. And in other ways, it really will. Um, and so I think, you know, similar to other other technologies, you you look at the internet that a lot of people talk about. Think about how the internet's impacted the role of the corporate board. If, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, a corporate board did the same thing corporate board does today, right? They're the individuals that they keep the leaders of the company, you know, in check and make sure that the shareholders are getting the best value that they can. That is never gonna change. But what can change is the mechanism through which they get information from the company, from their customers, and the way they deliver that information back down again, because suddenly you have a democratized access and input that is very different from, from previous technologies. So it really will just be a lever and a new avenue through which to move value and move information to the corporate board so that things become much more transparent and much clearer in, in the ways that the governance might might happen for, for the, the relationship between a board and a company. Let me just give a simple example for people who are maybe in my uh, domain of being IT uh, challenge. Uh, just a simple example of how the tokenization could affect someone, uh, like a simple plebeian person. If you have a small business, maybe you know, it's a few million dollar turnover or whatnot. You can't really 
you know, your only li liquidity option is to take a loan from the bank, or now they have some crowdsourcing options as well. But with tokenization, you can go to the DMCC here in Dubai, you can tokenize, you know, 20, 30% of your business. And then you can either sell that direct to your employees, or you could sell it to investors. And then that investor can take that token, which is will just be just like a Bitcoin or any other kind of uh, coin. And they can basically sell it to whoever they want. And you, as the owner, you have no control over that uh, over that sale or that movement of it afterwards, right? So one thing I would jump in is um, the the example you just used is only as strong as the rules and the governance upon which you decide in whatever jurisdiction you're in, right? So a lot of the time here in the U.S., because of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, the, the CFTC, the Fed, all these different agencies have a lot of rules for the role of tokens and what they can what they can be. Uh, used for and and other countries as well are putting in place these these different regulations. But really, the takeaway is the technology will be used to make the systems much more efficient, much faster, much more democratic. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to you know IPO in this example IPO a company via tokenization and not have the same levels of checks and rules that you have in the system today. It just it means that you know the rules may be the same, but the underlying technology makes it much more efficient. Um, but you're still going to be subject to different rules that, you know, the average person um, still has to go through a, a relatively long process to be able to, um, you know, issue shares and, and allow people economic upside in whatever venture they are investing in. So what, what should really board members be doing to equip themselves to be pre prepared for the transformation that's coming or looming or this, this tokenization cloud that's uh, coming over uh, us? What should we be doing? I'm happy to jump in and then and then Eli, please, please go for it. The the thing to me that I'm the, the thing that I would say really is it is it comes down to um just the role of technology. I mean, it's a similar parallel to AI, where if I were if I were a board member of, of a large organization today, I would absolutely spin up, you know, a research team to do a deep dive on the impact of this technology on my underlying business. With tokenization, it'll really be on the movement and storage of value and the representation of different aspects of the governance of the company, depending on the industry that you're in. So those would be my first two buckets that I would really focus on, um, but it, it very much depends. And one thing I'd also note is the timeline here is long. I think in crypto, people think in, you know, think in days and weeks, um, but in reality, this is going to be integrated into the global economy over decades, similar to the way that the internet is today. So with that, Eli, please, please jump in as well. That's a spot on. So basically, as a, when you, uh, you run a board and, uh, and you want to help a company, you want to help a company or you want to kind of uh, uh, support a, a, a CEO and his leadership team. What you need on the board is, first of all, is to have a, a, a voice of, uh, of truth. You know, you have to have somebody who uh, can explain, can articulate what this technology can do. And because, you know, the readings and the multi readings is not enough. It's just not enough. So I strongly, I strongly advocate to have somehow, somewhere, a trusted advisor somewhere in the board. So as a board member, I will be looking at a trusted advisor somehow, somewhere in the industry that I can rely on. And with this trusted advisor as part of the kind of uh, uh, as part of the, the board team, uh, I will look at how um, the CEO and the team think about being disrupted, how this industry, how their own industry is going to be disrupted by such a technology. It's how you how you prepare yourself for being disrupted, how the, how that tokenization thing is going to impact the company. And on one hand, you have those research team and they, they kind of work and they kind of do POCs and everything. That's kind of almost the, the, the technical side of it. But the strategic impact is to have at the CEO and the team this ability to plan the day after. So to plan for the day after, what is my company going to be when as a CEO, when this tokenization will have impacted my industry? What is it if it is going to my competitor first? You know, and on and on. So it's kind of creating a, as a board, 
under the, the auspice, under the, the, the support of a trusted technology advisor, I will try to make sure that the management team is thinking um, the impact of that technology coming uh, on the shore today, tomorrow, or in the very long term, doesn't matter. But the process is to be there all the time. And then, of course, as Farid was, you, Fadi, Mr. Fadi was used to say, you have, once the strategy is set, you have to review it and control it and monitor it. And that, that's kind of back to board as usual, I would say. Right. Well, maybe you guys can give us an insight as to, I mean, now here's this new technology. It's definitely nowhere near where it's going to be. Where is it actually today, you know, say in the Middle East? And, you know, luckily we have Mr. Thomas Cohen with us who could give us an insight as to what the Americans are up to uh, in this area as well. I mean, where is tokenization gotten to here in the Middle East and where is it exactly today in the U.S.? Yeah, happy to happy to to kick this off. Um, one of the fun things about tokenization is it's very much borderless. It's very similar to the internet in that you know there, you know it can be dependent on country based on regulation, but really it's completely borderless and global. Um, so when we look at where tokenization is today and where it will be over time and in the long run, most people, the tokenization nerds in our little world, agree that the long term most most assets, most value will end up somehow represented on chain. Um, today, very, very little of that, only about $2 trillion worth of value is, is tokenized on chain. And there's going to be many, many kind of different chapters of different assets as they go on chain. And really where we're seeing most product market fit today is on chain dollars, these things called stable coins. And their main utility is really just two, two things. First, to be able to move dollars more efficiently cross borders. Think, you know, just moving money for remittances is much more efficient using a stable coin because you cut out a lot of the intermediaries. Um, and second, as a store of value in, in, in emerging economies and, and other economies that don't have as much direct access to dollars to be able to maintain their and store their wealth, they're much more likely to jump on chain and, and use dollars because they want to maintain their wealth in dollar denominated assets. So that's really this first these first couple of years is where there's been main product market fit. Over the next couple of years, the next shift will be on-chain yield. So different debt products. And we've seen over the past year or so, there's been product market fit with, uh, with money market funds. Specifically, the most recent one that about two months ago, um, BlackRock launched a tokenized money market, government money market fund. Um, gives about 5% off. And, and that's really taken off because, it, you know, the world's largest, largest asset manager uh, to be able to issue something on chain makes a big difference. So that's where the market is today. And we'll see it move down the, the risk um, the risk profile and go into other debt products in, over the next maybe year or two. Um, and then we'll end up in in real estate and, you know, private equity funds and all that. But um, the story here is it's uh, it's it's a, it's a long one. Um, and progress is in some ways very slow and fast at the same time. Uh, but we're not going to wake up in two years and have everything be tokenized. We might wake up in 20 years, and that might be the case, but it's a long way. And to answer your question about where the Middle East is versus versus other parts other parts of the world, one thing about uh, having comparative regulatory clarity in, in Dubai, it means that we're seeing a lot of talent and a lot of capital flood into the region because they're given rules of the road. Whereas other, other parts of the world, including in the U.S., there is regulatory ambiguity. So it means that entrepreneurs and companies that want to innovate and use this new technology don't know what is allowed and what isn't. And so they're much less likely to use the technology because they simply don't know the rules of the road. We've seen uh, Mika will come into place in actually a month from today in, um, in Europe. Europe. And that is, that is a real full set of, of uh, digital asset rules in, in Europe. So. With that, that's that's kind of how I see the the tokenization landscape um, today and, and where it's going in the longer run. And so I'll just um, ask one more question before I. Oh, sorry, Ali, you were going to say something that I cut you just, off. Just a quick one. Yeah, I would like to pick up on the on this uh, regulation thing. The role of the board is not just towards its CEO. They, they, they the stakeholder as as part of the board, you have to look at the overall ecosystem, right? And governance is part of it. So the role of the board, who uh, understand and appreciate the kind of the impact of uh, tokenization into its company in the industry is acting, has 
a mandate to go and work with the regulators of this world or make sure there is a process whereby the regulator of their, uh, uh, their, their, their uh, um, vicinity uh, is embarked and is being part of the of the of the journey. So you would, you were asking me how does it impact the, the the board? The board has to work with the has to lobby and work with the regulator uh, so to secure the governance of the of the company they are on board. Okay, and so you guys are doing something different with uh, the sports. So just wanted to ask one question before we turn it to the audience. Um, you, you're running a company with the tokenization of the sports industry. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's going to look? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the journey that everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. And when we were saying that back 20 years ago, that everything that can be digitized will be digitized. You know, at the end of the day, this this has happened. So I think the journey, we might agree, disagree with Thomas. This is five years, 10 years, 20 years, we don't know. But, you know, it's a this is an unknown. But at the end of the day, it will be that economy. The economy will be tokenized economy, the blockchain economy. So that's kind of, it, it doesn't make it down. So after finance, then you look at this and say, what are the other industries that can be tokenized, right? You look at that. And then, of course, you think of real estate, you think of art, you think of all kinds of industries, but sport, sport fits tokenization perfectly because it's sports is all about communities. In, and when you look at, at the kind of the tokenization concept, you know, the crypto, the crypto worked because it was working through communities, by communities, for communities, right? The minor community, the traders community, etc. So the whole thing is how you, you look at the sport and you say, what? What can be what can happen in the in the sport industry? First, you have to connect the sport estates to the to the funds. Then you have to connect the sport estate to their capital, and then you have to to connect the players with the funds, the players with the economic uh, environment. If you look at today, if you if you look at today, a between two clubs, they will one will sell a player, right? And then you have all those middlemen who are taking. Uh, big chunk of money and 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 take time and everything. So the same way Thomas was explaining that combining the value and the and the liquidity together, you're gonna have you're gonna win speed. So all of a sudden those kind of trades will be A transparent, B fast, and third, they will be open to participation to the public, to the people, to the fans, to the stakeholders. So that's the first thing. Then same for the club. The club raise capital. How they, do they raise capital? So, in in the web in um, in the Middle East, it's a bit different. There is no capital uh, constraints for the clubs, but they they there is always a, a a willingness to increase the capital and embark the uh, the new fund into it. Why? Because the fund of today, and I was yesterday I was yesterday at the final in in Athens between between Olympiakos and Fiorentina. There is no one single person in the stadium not uh, watching at their phone, right? The, so the, the fan has turned digital. So once you have you have that change in the behavior, the new generation of fans of sport consum consumers have nothing to do with what you and me, Shane, were used to, to do, basically sitting behind the screen very passively. This is over. So sport is transforming itself through that digitalization and tokenization will enable, accelerate that transformation and um, giving uh, leverage, leveraging that transformation to, for the benefits of the club estates and the, um, and, and the players obviously, and of course for the good of the, the, of the sport consumer, consumers. Great, great. Um, so I don't know if we have any uh, any uh, questions here. It looks like Mrs. Sultana. Okay, well, I guess we'll go with Mrs. S Mrs. Sultana. Then you have your hand uh, raised. So uh, please go ahead. I think you're. I think you yes, need to. Yes, I think you. I think you guys you can hear me now, right? Yep. There you go. Sure. Yes. Okay. Um. Thank you so much, Mr. Ellie and Mr. Thomas. So my question for you guys is. 
Um, when it comes to organizational hierarchies, there is often significant gaps in tech literacy. How would one ensure that digital advancements such as AI and tokenization is central to the board's decisions, thus reducing resistance and suspicion from other members? Thomas? <laughs> I mean, I think um, in many ways, your question is tech agnostic, right? Like over, you can look back over the past couple of decades and there's always a new technology that requires new education. There's always right. new level mm -hmm. of constant learning. And so as a result, the question is what you as an organizational leader, what mm -hmm. uh, systems and processes you put in place to ensure that your workforce is constantly, constantly learning right. about whatever is new so that you're on, you know, the, the edge of innovation in, in the industry. And so to me, it would be less, if I were structuring it, I would focus less on a topic and more on a system that's topic agnostic. So that in five years, when the new technology comes out that everyone has to know about it, your organization is already situated and organized in a way that's already mm -hmm. on top of it and educating your key workforce. So today it might be tokenization and AI. Five years from now, it might be something right. else. And so mm -hmm. I think I would focus more on the process and the system than less on the technology, because if you have a good process, that technology will already be built in. Um, for tokenization specifically, one thing that it does really allow is it allows, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, for Un, unparalleled transparency and, and new levels of governance. So you can really see where decisions are made, how they're made, who's making them, and in what ways that can help advance the interests of the organization at every level, not only at the employee level, but also at the C-suite level and in the, the, the board level as well. So I would really focus on the structure and less on the technologies, but I'm, I'm curious what, what others have, have to, what Ali, you, you have to jump on to as well. Yeah, I think, I think we, need to, we need to move on because I have uh, uh, a lady who is in the middle of another conference and she's jumping into our conference to join us. But I think um, uh, Thomas and Ellie are available on uh, LinkedIn as well. You can reach out on the various uh, social media platforms. And uh, I think some of the key takeaways here that uh, they were pointing out is that tokenization allows us to move information uh, both information and value at the same time, which it wasn't necessarily the case with our other our other options. Uh, it also, uh, you know, one of the things that we need to do is do a deep dive on how it's going to disrupt our industries. Uh, they gave us a good wa warning on that, and make sure you have a voice of truth on the board who uh, is going to be uh, the lighthouse on that on that point. Um, he was telling us that there's already two trillion dollars uh, tokenized across the world. And uh, I think one of the moves is to use uh, stable coins that are really uh, linked, denominated to dollar uh, assets represented by tokens. Um, and really uh, kind of uh, good uh, uh, litmus test is that uh, BlackRock is launching a tokenized money market. And uh, so the largest asset manager in the world is on board. Um, we should probably take note of that. It's, it's a trend that's, that's unraveling before our eyes. Um, Guys, thanks again. I know you, you, you're all the way from the United States of America. Um, we wish you guys good luck in your elections in uh, November. We'll all be watching the fun as that unfolds. And uh, thanks again for joining us. And Ellie, uh, thank you so much for making time. Uh, a global executive who's really seen the, the battlefield, uh, both from the boardroom and uh, from the corner office perspective. So it's always a, a real pleasure to have your, your insights and your experience uh, with us today. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, speakers, uh, very, uh, very special group here that we have. Um, and it's a, a very big uh, honor uh, to have uh, one of the, uh, well, our first speaker here uh, is a, a lady who has been uh, on numerous times selected as the most powerful Arab businesswoman for seven consecutive years from 2014 to 2020 by uh, Forbes Middle East. She's also been awarded best woman in the corporate sector in MENA by the Amcham MENA Regional Council and has previously voted as one of the most powerful women in Jordan by Jordan Business Magazine. Um, she is the CEO of Al Ittihad Bank um, where she's been the CEO since 2008. And uh, prior to her career in banking, she served as a minister of information and communications for, of technology 
and uh, the Ministry Secretary General from 2003 to 2006, making major contributions to the development of the ICT sector in uh, Jordan. And uh, she has an MBA from the American University in Cairo and uh, is uh, really a giant among her peers. And it's a real honor to introduce uh, Miss uh, Her Excellency, Miss Nadia Al Said. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Son. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's nice to have you. I know that you're in the middle of a few things over there, so I appreciate you squeezing us in. And uh, she will be accompanied uh, by a gentleman who's really been uh, a stalwart of the uh, public sector uh, markets in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is currently uh, the chairman and independent board member with BNY Mellon Saudi Financial Company. Uh, he has over 27 years experience in technology, finance, capital markets. Uh, he was previously the CEO of the Tadawal, the Saudi Stock Exchange, for almost 12 years, from 2001 to 2013. And uh, he's, in fact, helped lead the establishment of the Saudi Stock Exchange itself, a spearhead and pillar of expertise around corporate governance in the region, and a man who's really helped the evolution of the public markets across the GCC. Um, he, has served, he has served and is serving on numerous boards, uh, both state-owned, private, and family-owned, uh, both within Saudi and internationally. Uh, he's an independent uh, board member with an objective of leading and assisting transformations uh, across uh, so many different industries. And it's a real pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Abdullah al Sulaimi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shane, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, greetings from Riyadh. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, well, one of the fun things with this uh, event is we have uh, so many uh, people are so international from all different uh, regions and areas. So uh, I think we had all the way from New York to Saudi. And that's the kind of world I guess we're, we're in today where uh, it's so interconnected. Um, and uh, so it is quite exciting to uh, to have you both uh, with us and uh, and um, really uh, wanting to talk a little bit about your view. I think both of you guys, uh, both of you uh, professionals have uh, that experience of both being a CEO and being on the board because a lot of the board members have never been CEOs and and vice versa, which is actually a trend, I guess, starting from our opener, Mr. Fadi Gandur, who who also, uh, did both, which I think adds a lot of value into, I mean, I guess, does that does that play a factor when you're sitting on the board and you're saying, oh, well, when I'm a CEO, this is kind of what I'd like to see from my board members? Or does it play a role, do you think, in in how you approach the position of, uh, of your board roles? Is, 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 okay, um, I can start here. Sure. Of course it does. I mean, uh, when, when, when you have these discussions, well, many of the discussions are common around strategy, around performance, around communication, around the leadership team. And uh, well, and every time you say, okay, well, this situation, I have been there before and I would have liked it to be addressed this way uh, or it was addressed this way and it was very efficient and it worked. Uh, on the other side, also, you, you have all the scenarios and the situations where things have worked against you or against the uh, institution. So you build on those experiences and, and definitely makes a big difference having been a CEO uh, before. And Your Excellency? Yeah, I think, yes, it does help. I think it makes you true to your values, true to what you believe in. Because when you exercise both, when you see both, I think you have to sort of uh, uh, apply the same standard. So, uh, so I mean, like um, being a CEO and sort of having aspirations on what to expect, what kind of support, what kind of vision would you like from the board? And then what are the governance boundaries that you want them to respect? I would say you would reciprocate that when you are uh, a board member. So I would say it gives you a 360 view and it does help complement uh, the view. Sure. So, I mean, I guess one of the key things there is just getting that alignment or when we see those assets that have 
you know, tremendous value creation, really that alignment between the board and the CEO and the ability to allocate resources quickly, um, to make things happen quickly. Um, what do you feel, uh, you know, or how should the board and the CEO ensure they have the same North Star that they're heading in the same direction? Uh, maybe your excellency, you can uh, start with that one. Uh, and what are some of the approaches you use to make sure that alignment happens? Well, I think that it's it's really a complementary relationship and probably uh, to, to add to some of the things that were mentioned earlier, I would say that uh, uh, there has to be agreement between the board and the top management on what the strategy, what the North Star is. Now, okay, in, in, a, in an industry like mine, uh, I mean, like banking and uh, financial institution, uh, financial institutions are highly regulated. So in a way, you have the regulator and the regulation, you have the environment that you're working in, but you do also have some uh, sort of parameters that the shareholders provide. You need to know what kind of capital are you working with, you know, like you want to know what is the sort of uh, appetite, the markets, etc. So maybe in a way, okay, if I would balance that with what was said earlier in terms of uh, also the role of the CEO in articulating where should the, the company go forward. I would say there's always a kind of a pre-discussion, uh, if you wish, which has to do with the parameters that we want to work within and the direction, because, you know, like in today's world and with the evolution and with the changing world, I mean, no one can do everything. So you really need to set an all-star and you really need to know what you want to do. And then uh, you need to know the parameters that you will be working within. And then probably in today's world as well, there is a lot of, uh, uh, um, I mean, like there's a lot of best practice. There is a lot of uh, where the world's going. I mean, like oh, coming to my industry again, which is banking and financial services. I mean, there's been huge convergence between uh, uh, financial services, the startup world, the fintech world, uh, the digital world, and so on. So you really need to, to cope a lot. And uh, there is a lot of where the world's going as well that you need to be uh, working with. And I think, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, it's very important that the board and the management see eye to eye. And it's very important that they respect each other's roles. But also in today's world, I think board members, uh, if uh, chosen based on merit and uh, expertise in certain uh, futuristic disciplines, can add a lot of value and can shed a lot of light on, on many areas and on how, on how some things can be best done. Right. And, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Abdullah, how do you uh, see it? Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that Ms. Nadia just said. Um, I think it's important to have this initial alignment between the board and the CEO and the management team on the vision, mission, purpose, and, and values. And then coming up with these uh, uh, strategic plans, where do we want to, to take the business next? The potential challenges and and all importantly is the um, resource uh, allocation. Um, what I, I I always say is boards expect of management is is competence is number one, number two performance and number three is transparency. So this regular communication with the board is important. Reporting the, to the board on a regular basis, on both what was achieved and also uh, the challenges that we're facing and if we need to uh, make adjustments to, to our, our plans. Then the board can provide a strategic uh, guidance and also uh, oversight. And uh, it depends on the industry, like what Ms. Nadia was saying earlier, there are um, industries that are um, sort of heavily regulated, like in the finance industry. Then you also wanna make sure you're compliant uh, with the relevant corporate governance, compliance requirements uh, all the way. And, and you need to listen to also get risk management reports on a regular basis and make sure that you're making corrective actions when required. Right, right. Well, we have uh, actually with us Dr. Ashra from, uh, from Hakama, who uh, does a lot of work around this as well. I think he uh, wants to chime in here. Uh, Dr. Ashraf, are you there? 
Uh, yes, I mean, thank you so much for giving me the chance and thank you so much, uh, uh, Your Excellency and Mr. Abdullah for, for this very uh, uh, important information. Um, I just wanted to say that, that I mean, from, from reality and dealing with lots of boards in the region and, and board evaluation and so on, I think what, what you mentioned is one of the most tricky parts, which is the relationship between the board and the CEO where uh, unfortunately when we look at sometimes uh, agendas and, and and you know for for boards of directors uh, we see a lot of operational issues being discussed at the boardroom um and and even sometimes we see resolutions which are more on the operational side i'm not sure how you how i'm um, what's experience with this and how can the ceo try to make sure that the board is not really involved in operations and it's more strategic and oversight and guidance because that's a complaint from lots of CEOs that, that we deal with, actually. Yeah, I, I really think it it, it it differs from one board to the other. And I really, it has a lot to do with the composition of the board and maybe some of the issues that were mentioned before. Who's on the board? I mean, like for, for banks, for example, uh, regulators interfere and there is a number of independent board members who have to be there yet of course some of the issues mentioned earlier on the fact that maybe uh, you will have some of the owners sitting on the board and so on and you will have the the uh, uh, the, the, the CEO on the other hand I, I also think it has to do with I mean what uh, in this case what the C what the board expect expects but what the CEO accepts as well so I would say that uh, with banking, again, it's such a big fiduciary responsibility. You're liable. You are the one who is liable, you, you see. So I would say you have to draw the line of where what, okay, one has to be open-minded, has to be uh, open to discussions and to new ideas more and more in today's world. But you're the one with the fiduciary responsibility and you're the one who needs to draw the line. And if you feel that things are crossing border, I don't think uh, one should stay. Hmm. Yes, good point. Uh, Mr. Abdallah, what do you feel? Yeah, uh, I mean, micromanagement is, is stifles innovation, demoralizes management. I'm, 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 I have a strong view uh, against this, and, and I have the, seen this from both sides. I think um, the the... We should expect, expect, set expectations and limits from the, the beginning. The board and the chairman has, has a role, but also the CEO has a role to play in reminding the board of their sort of boundaries when, when you run uh, into some of these cases. Uh, it's important that the, uh, the CEO is, is held accountable and the, with the executive team for the performance and for the execution of the agreed business strategy. If the board realizes, well, they need to jump in because the team is incompetent, well, then the correct action is uh, to, to bring in competent management rather than micromanage. Right, right. So uh, one of the big topics now uh, with everyone's talking about is the digital transformation. We kind of had a warning uh, now from our tech gurus on the, on the, pre on the earlier session uh, about the dis massive disruption that's coming to tokenization. Also, uh, having both of you in the financial sector um, might be interesting as a side note to get what your take is on this tokenization thing. How disruptive will it be? Uh, people are always uh, talking about how the banks are going to be up for disruption, but it seems like you just continue to post billion dollar profits uh, uh, year after year. So I don't know uh, how vulnerable you actually are to that. Um, but uh, how 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 are you approaching now this digital revolution, um, and uh, what what's your perspective on what's the on the horizon here for for the sector, Your Excellency? Could, could we start yeah, with you? Yeah, I think of course. Yeah, I think the digital transformation or the digital revolution is is a reality, and I think the right move is to embrace it and is to actually try to see how can you stay ahead of the game and how you partner with, with the, when whatever a partnership makes sense because uh, shying away from it uh, will will only i mean like will only put you out of uh, of business really especially if we look at where the world is heading and uh, with digitization and ai and machine learning and if we add to that the how the generation z are sort of uh, acting and what are their expectations as consumers 
uh, basically they will accept nothing less than best in class uh, digital experiences. So I think I really, I truly believe that in today's world, uh, digital uh, transformation is going to define uh, what customer experience is. And actually it's going to be what you compete for. Because if you compete for price, price wars can never be good. If you compete on just launching new products, new products are copied the next day. So really it's about uh, customer experience. And uh, that's the only thing, customer experience and culture actually, are the only things that cannot be copied the next day and they're the, the real competitive advantage. And also, uh, I mean, like uh, in today's world, this works both ways, internally and externally. Internally, uh, the digitization is allowing uh, uh, companies to, uh, uh, to, to, I mean, like to uh, uh, go to other levels of customer experience, of uh, uh, of efficiencies, of cost savings, of uh, actually new ways to market, new ways to to profile and understand customers, uh, new ways to to design products and services, new ways to be embedded in your customers' lives. So basically, that, that's that's a key. And on the uh, delivery part, uh, part of it, I mean, it's allowing scalability at a level that has never been uh, thought of before. I mean, like for us, for example, as the bank, in today's world, we already have 60% uh, of our new to bank customers coming from the digital channels being fully digitally onboarded without coming to a branch. And this is increasing every day. And actually, in today's world, uh, uh, transactions are really done through the channels. I mean, our internal processes are almost all uh, straight through processing and automated. And more and more technology is helping uh, manage things in a different way. Decision making, credit decisions are, are, are being done uh, with almost real time uh, information. Uh, I mean, uh, like... Uh, uh, things that were uh, looked at as obstacles before are starting to be through technology and digitization are being built into customer journeys. I mean, like today, uh, if you know how to manage, uh, to do risk management properly, how to do compliance properly, that becomes an advantage. If you could use it as an advantage rather than a burden as it was uh, sort of perceived before. So I think this is where the world's going. And uh, this is what's uh, what kind of uh, customer experience uh, that is expected uh, from the new generation. But and what what's your take on on tokenization? Does it represent any kind of existential threat to the banking no, player? It, actually, tokenization uh, uh, not really. I mean, like it it it's not existential. It is something we deal with. I mean, like if anything, you would have thought that we would have seen. Uh, fintechs as an existential threat but then uh, with time and with as, again as i said as you embrace change and find the right partnerships you see that in today's world uh, you 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 talk now about something called embedded finance which is all these platforms that uh, let's say serve certain segments of the market while they are not interested nor qualified to do the banking side of things or the compliance side of things and so on so you become the bank serving them and uh, uh, like you see some, some of course, there, there is impact on our operating models from fintechs because some of them actually, they, they specialize only in one service. They become very good at it. They do it very well. They decouple what, they, what we do and they just do one thing. They do transfers, for example, or they do credit cards, for example, and they become so good at it and it becomes so competitive and so on. So it affects your operating model and how will you deal, deal with that? But so far it, it, it's, I mean, like it, it just forces you to change your operating model for tokenization i would say i would i would look at it similar to the way we look at uh, climate change let's say okay climate change enforces a new discipline into risk management it enforces us to enforces a way of uh, evaluating assets okay we'll have to see if, if land is being affected by climate change or a certain geographic pl place so it, it plays into your risk assessment it plays in, into pricing it plays into your own targets and your own green finance targets and what do you want to achieve so i would say tokenization will have impact on assets and on operating models of your customers. So you need to understand that and you need to build that into your risk management and you need to, to, uh, to build for new products and services that will cater to this. Right, right. Mr. Abdallah, what are, what are your thoughts on the topic? 
Yeah, so um, just a comment on, on tokenization. I, I think it's it's coming our way. I think once regulators have figured out the risks, the pros and cons of, of tokenization, especially in, in financial services, then we'll see more activity there. Um, one of the businesses uh, I, I sit on the board of is, is in the tokenization um, uh, side. Um, on, on digital transformation, I think in, in today's landscape, um, it is crucial for businesses to, to stay uh, competitive. And it's, it's important for boards to take lead, leadership, leadership and, and strategic guidance uh, by understanding the landscape that they uh, work within, the risk tolerance and, and oversight, and then allocating the, the, the appropriate resources to um, execute this digital tra transformation. Also, it may be necessary, depending on the composition of the board, to have the digital expertise on the board itself to provide this uh, required oversight of the execution. And then performance monitoring along the way of this uh, transformation and, and supporting the um, uh, executive team. But it's something that's gonna be ongoing with us with the new generation, um, if a service is not available on the app, on their iPhone or Samsung, then for them, it just doesn't exist. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Ashraf, what do you think as from Hakama's perspective and what are you seeing? I mean, because you work with so many different boards across the region. Mm -hmm. What what do you really see the boards doing in terms of preparing for enabling and driving the digital transformation that's that's happening? Across the region. I think it's a key challenge actually for the management, I have to admit. I mean, from lots of especially banks and, and, and the financial institutions that we have been dealing with, I think the key challenge is the management because they are very strong technically, they understand the market, they see the competition, they see the threats coming from, say, uh, fintech and, and, and maybe other, other uh, uh, sources of, of uh, technology threats. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the boards uh, are sometimes not at the same level as the speed as the management. Now, usually for digital transformation, what you need is you need investment and you need endorsement. And of course, you have to consider a key element there, which is cybersecurity or the security actually of using this technology. Uh, we have lots of cases that you, you read about now in globally about AI, for example, and how there are legal implications and risks in dealing and using AI in, 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 in uh, enabling your, your services uh, um, and improving customer experience. So I think the key challenge we have seen is boards sometimes are not really fully convinced and willing to invest a lot in, in, in the area of digitalization. And that's where the management has to, to bring it to, to their attention. I recall last year, actually one of the head of, of uh, uh, risks in one of the big banks in the UE, and, and he said that he wanted to invest heavily in the area of, of uh, you know, uh, pro uh, protection and, and cyber security and, and uh, security, data security in the bank. And, and the board was, was reluctant and he had to bring in lots of cases from global experience and banks and amount of money that were lost because of, of uh, poor security until they approved that, that uh, the bank can invest this amount of money. So I think that's the challenge, which is how to convince the board. So in, in my opinion, the management has a key role to play in educating the board and, and making them understand what are the issues so that the board will uh, support them eventually. Now, in theory, we say the board is about the strategy and, and the foresight and guidance. In this area, maybe it's too technical for them. So the management will really play the role of getting the buy-in from the board and convincing them, and, and then they can get their support in this digital transformation and, and so on. And it's moving very fast that, that, that this really has to, to be done in, in a very sort of fast and very efficient way. And we have seen sometimes where committees are created between the board members and the management to try to speed up the process. Uh, I mean, the management has to think of how to do it right. It's as simple as this. Uh, so, so, so that they, they get the support and, and budgets and investments from the board of directors. Sure, I'll just turn it over to the audience quickly. I think uh, our audience member, Mr. Sergey, uh, has a quick question for the panel. Sergey, are you still uh, yes. there? Yes. Oh, there you thank are. You. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Exciting discussion. And returning to the point of relationships between the CEO and um, the board members uh, about this uh, red line that uh, Nadia was mentioning. So uh, I have 
from my own experience, a model how to how to build up this relationship uh, with a member of a board on four companies different and uh, stepping into the board role, I sort of assigned a pledge to myself. I'm not the CEO and I'm not be ordering and I'm not be, uh, uh, how to say it, I'm not be mandating the CEO, but I will be convincing. I will be convincing by my past experience, but logical reasoning, but not ordering. It's it's a sort of a role that, as far as I understand, exists in Italian mafia. They have a big boss and uh, so-called consigliere. So the consigliere is actually advising, bringing that reasoning, bringing facts and figures, arguments, but he cannot dictate obviously to the big boss. My question is, is that that sort of a model could be uh, how that's implemented widely? Could it be a role model of that establishment of that borders or red lines? that you were talking about. So what's your opinion on that? Thank you. I saw I saw your excellency smiling. So maybe uh, and maybe she'll go first. I like the, <laughs> the analogy. I like the resemblance. Well, I think it's difficult. I think, you know, like, uh, I think the roles are clear. And uh, if everyone, I mean, like, Definitely, there is a change. I mean, like with what I was explaining and with this change in where the world is going and this continuous change or in a world, as we all say, where change has become the only constant. Definitely, you need to look at things differently. But yet, I think a board is a board and the CEO is a CEO. And if both uh, respect the roles and the boundaries and if both are open to, of course, uh, conversations and to benefit from each other. I mean, like me as a CEO, I gladly welcome insights and knowledge coming from the board. And actually in today's world, I think it's essential to have board members who have digital experiences, ones who understand sustainability and climate change, others who uh, uh, understand the futuristic trends in different you know, data, for example, because you need these people also, you get insights from them. And at the same time, you need these people to be on the board for the for the buy-in because as as was mentioned earlier uh, these new trends require a lot of investment so you need the board to understand the value and definitely you get a lot of insight from them but having said that uh, it has to be the balanced relationship that respects the roles and responsibilities and uh, i don't believe you need intermediaries i mean thank you Wait, mr abdullah yeah i, I think uh, yeah i i like the um sort of the, the approach to things. I, I wish this can be adopted, but um, the same way we expect boards to be diverse in terms of backgrounds, industries, expertise, etc., you will have board members who also have different ways of approaching things and, and addressing their, their agendas. I think it boils down to the uh, tone that the chairman of the board can set uh, up front I think that's that's very important to be agreed upfront between the CEO and the chairman and then communicated to the rest of the board members. I know, and, and Dr. Ashraf, what, what's your take on this? Um, well, I mean, I, I really have to agree with the group, honestly speaking, on, on this. I mean, the idea of, of uh, as, as Her Excellency was, was talking about that, we should know the board, uh, okay, they have their own boundaries and management as well. However, in, in times of digitization and big investments and times of crisis, of course, they are much closer than this. Uh, and the fre frequency of meetings is, is much higher and the interaction is much higher. So we always talk about, you know, that, that uh, you know, in, in the engagement between the board and the management, you have two extremes. One of them is the passive board, which is, totally hands off, they don't do anything. The other one, which is the operating board, and then you have the engaged board, which is which is in between. However, in reality, things might move a little bit. So for example, during the pandemic, we have seen which, which, which is a good thing. Boards getting very close to the management because now we need to be together in trying to face the, the problems and, and face the challenges. Uh, so, so, so that's really something which, which might happen. However, I think one of the key things which were mentioned lightly or, or, or uh, 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 you know, politely here, that, or, or in a hidden way, the skills, the skills matrix of the board members. 
that has to be changed. Now, now, who was a good board member five, six years ago is not necessarily a good member now, board member now. We need a diversity of skills. We need somebody to understand digital. We need understand somebody to understand technology. Uh, we need some younger generation. We need diversity on the board, male and female, and, 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 and different backgrounds and so on. So the old engineers board, the old finance people board is, is not working. So Again, I think it's a good idea for the boards to revisit their skills matrix to see what do we need for the coming three or two, five years, for example. And, and then we start to influence it. The, the, the challenge in the region, and Mr. Abdullah knows this better than me, is the way in which the boards are being composed in the region is simply from the region shareholders. So usually in most of the cases, you have two or three big shareholders who actually decide on who are the board members in this case. And, and and we need to influence the way the, in which they are choosing the board members. So I don't mind that they will put the board members, but then we need to make sure that we have the skills required. And, and that's why we have a practice in the region, which is not really common outside of the region. And that is you have committees of the board who have members who are not board members. So because shareholders put people on the board who don't really understand certain things. So what happens is we need to add a member to the committee who is not a board member so that to fill in these gaps. This means that we don't have the right skill metrics on the board. And that's where, again, the challenge is both for the CEO and for the board to try to influence the decision by the shareholders on what kind of skills are missing on the board itself, just to make sure that actually it is really effective and it is doing the job that it should be doing uh, uh, for, for the bank or for the company. Well, thank you so much for that. I know that uh, Your Excellency, uh, you're a little bit tight on time, and uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to be respectful of that. So sorry we went a few over, and we didn't get to talk about a uh, topic that you're very uh, uh, passionate about, which is sustainability and diversity, and is also a topic which Dr. Ashraf is extremely passionate about. Sorry for that. Uh, but again, wanted to thank you. And also, uh, Mr. Abdullah, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, to give us yeah. your insights mm -hmm. on these points. And uh, it's very rare that we get uh, such senior people who have really, really contributed to uh, corporate governance of the region in so many ways to, to get your insights on these topics. So just really want to have a, a big thank you for you and uh, appreciation uh, from our uh, participants. Thank you so much for uh, for joining. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the the next uh, one up now we have uh, one of um, you know everybody's favorite sector. If you're in the Middle East, I think we have. It seems like more hotels per capita in Dubai than any other city I've ever been to. I don't know, but uh, I could be wrong. Um, we have an expert coming on who will give us a, a, a visual onto what's happening, and of course. Uh, you know, I think one of the big trends in Saudi Arabia is also uh, to create as as many um, hotels as possible. Or some of the clients we visit are, have crazy numbers that they that they they have triple digit uh, numbers in terms of the number of the hotels that they want to create. Um, so it's always good to keep a finger on the pulse as what's happening in the hotel industry. And uh, we have here uh, one of the top experts across the region. Uh, she has advised on more than five thousand hospitality and mixed use projects in the last 20 years across Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Uh, and she works across valuations, acquisitions, asset management, strategic investments and development, contract negotiations, and general real estate strategic advisory. Um, she is an alumni of Harvard, Cornell, and Essex business schools and has authored more than 50 publications in addition to speaking frequently at investment and hospitality related conferences on a range of topics. Uh, she has also recently received the Industry Excellence Award in consideration of her ongoing commitment and contribution to the industry. Please welcome Ms. Hala Chofani, who is the, uh, sorry, she is the president of uh, HVS Middle East Africa and South Asia. Welcome, Ms. Hala. Thank you, Shane. Lovely to be here with you. Coming in last on this talk, I'm going to have to spice it up to keep the other participants. So thank you for everyone who's still there. Yeah, we expect nothing less but the spiciest of spices. Maybe. But I, I was scared <laughs> no to get your title on because you're in so many different uh, geographies, Middle East, Africa and South Asia. South Asia. So that's a right. huge expanse yeah. uh, across, uh, across that, uh, that area. 
And uh, one of the favorite uh, industries here is has to be, um, you know, the the hotels, right? I think once you're a family group, uh, you have to have a hotel or two in your portfolio, and some of them uh, have more than that. Um, so excited to talk to you about uh, what's happening in this area. Uh, so what does the future of the hotel industry look like? Are we getting oversaturated or is there, I think literally across from my office, they're building another five-star hotel, like literally a hundred feet from us. And we already have a JW Marriott here. We have an Oberoi, we have a Anantara, we have a Taj. And they're like, well, we need one more. So is it oversaturated? Is it not? What can we expect? What's the trend? The simple answer is not, and I'll tie it back to when I first arrived in Dubai, I think 2000, when there were only 1,500 keys, and today we have 150,000 keys in Dubai only, with very solid performance, very solid occupancy. So again, just for the benefit of giving a bit of a quick macro, micro view of this sector, I mean, clearly the travel and tourism is growing uh, globally, but I think more importantly, me personally, having worked also across different continents, including Europe, Asia, and in the last 15 years, uh, Middle East and Africa, there is no better time in terms of both development and opportunities than the Middle East region, right? So we're looking at it from a real estate standpoint, but also from an operational standpoint. And, you know, when we zoom at the GCC in particular, I mean, clearly we will all agree that Dubai, the UAE has done indisputable success. So today when we talk about the UAE, there is, as you rightly said, I mean, Hotels continue to pop up, but demand continues to grow. So we've got Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Rack really competing on the global map. But just now, next door, we have the second wave of transformation and the significant change that is happening in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Some of it is underway, but clearly the outlook looks at much more of the development, which will also serve as a catalyst, right? So personally, I think the future outlook is quite promising. Uh, quite competitive. I mean, it's not all very rosy, right? It's quite competitive because today we're not necessarily competing between the JW and the Ritz. We're competing between countries and not just on a cross-border. We're competing down with Egypt and Morocco and Turkey. And perhaps that's where my involvement with so many different continents, just seeing it from a destination standpoint. But the outlook is positive. It is competitive, which I think then ties nicely into what we're going to be discussing now around how do we make sure that we do have the right strategic direction, we're doing the right investments, the way we're executing, and uh, you know how do we operate in such a competitive and uh, sophisticated environment? Right. Yo, that's amazing. So when you were in Dubai, two thousand one, it was fifteen hundred keys, and now we have one hundred and fifty thousand. That's just that's Dubai, it. or yeah, and that's only Dubai, Dubai, and that's probably another ten thousand. So. <laughs> percent growth in the next couple of years and specifically that was adding the Grand Hyatt down by the, the Grand Hyatt was 600 keys and you know the question was you know this is going to double supply what's going to happen and you know if we talk about success stories we've seen the likes of Jumeirah setting up very successfully we looked at hotel companies such as Rodana taking home and based in the UAE but then also being able to expand regionally and perhaps more recently internationally so there is, has been a lot of uh, definitely growth from a real estate standpoint, less so perhaps from an operating model standpoint when we compare to the uh, presence of the international groups. But overall, the opportunity is there. It's just making sure that, you know, as with any other sector, this is rather a much more long-term sustainable investments that we are doing. And so how will, you know, how will the local players stand up to the heat, the searing fires of the international multinationals as, as they come in? I mean, do you feel that the local groups um, at the board level have the right configuration? I mean, we always say in our business that uh, CEOs can't succeed where boards fail. And, um, you know, you look at some of the international companies, they'll have, you know, maybe a tech guru from Google or from Facebook or whatever on their board, uh, they'll really have kind of the best of the best. And then, you know, you come into the Middle East and there's a reluctance of the family group sometimes to bring in outsiders into the board. Um, there's uh, obviously going to be family members there. 
you know, are they set up at the board level to to uh, to fi- to win this fight? Are they positioned for the win at the board level, or what do what's your perspective on the hotel boards in this region? Sure, and I'm going to start off with a disclaimer, just by being an advisor, that you know my observations are rather interacting with boards. I mean, I clearly sit on a couple of boards, but this is rather a function of my sense and having worked with boards over the last 15 years, perhaps the, the major shift and change that I can share today is what has been happening in the last five years. But also to put things in con- in context, because it wouldn't be fair to actually address whether the local boards can compete with the international boards or they're at the same level. I mean, international boards, we all know they have much longer history. They have managed to iron out many of the issues that today perhaps Middle Eastern groups and GCC family groups are trying to iron out as they go through this transition. But one thing that is more relevant to the hospitality ownership structure in this part of the world, and I think it's very important that we address, is the fact that for most part of these either owning companies or operating companies, these are family companies. And therefore, there, as we both would agree, Shane, there are certain challenges that still need to be ironed out. And, and again, I mean, without going into too much detail, but perhaps the few that we are having to manage and we being as advisors is really looking at it from the standpoint of we're going from a generation to another generation. So there has been a lot of wealth and preserving that wealth is understandable. And some have succeeded by just being reactive, not even proactive, although today we call for proactive strategic direction. So that's one. Then you've got the younger family members that are basically saying, let's go into acquisitions, investments, let's add vertical lines. Let's just go out there and do things differently. And perhaps many of us on the call today sit somewhere in between to say, okay, let's see how we can ease off this tension or conflict. So I think I just wanted to put this out there because it's one of those that even earlier on ties into what Sultana said and Fadi with regards to family members. How do you deal with that? Because clearly there are different interests and there's no right and wrong. It's a question of, do we want to grow? Do we want to change our business model? Is there an opportunity and do we want to step into it? And it is not an easy, straightforward exercise, right? So that's, you know, that's one thing to really acknowledge about the local groups. And because of the way they are structured, at many times and without generalizing, some of those decisions are very emotional. Like in the finance world, we say it's egoistic investments or emotional investments. Perhaps the better term would be the emotional attachment to what they stand for and what they're aspiring to become. So today, these groups, to answer questions directly they're not expected to compete at the international level what the way we work with those groups is to actually redefine or reassess or reestablish their identity and the strategic direction they're taking and how what do they need to do and you know whether they have this right sort of board composition board mix who do they need to employ what do they need to do differently um perhaps you know governance is one of also the areas in which because the decision making is done in a in a in a traditional manner or a different manner, let's put it this way, there isn't governance and accountability. And therefore so far this hasn't been really a key focus. And I but just to wrap up on this point is my sense, at least in the last three years, is that for most parts of the groups that have strong aggressive expansion plans, they realize that there is a need to have functional boards, to have diversified boards, higher specialized board member, whether it's from the international community or people with regional experience, to actually ensure that they are able to deliver on that growth and ultimately potentially compete with the international brands. Right. Well, I mean, I think there there, uh, is something also to be said for the family groups because while they might not have uh, some of those kind of celebrity board members that uh, fiddle, filter in and out of the boardroom, they have loyalty, they have dedication, they have commitment, they have a blood oath to the brand, um, which is quite stronger. And then, you you know, you see uh, some of these celebrity boards fail, like in these big scandals, like the Theranos one, where they had 
they were supposed to do blood testing uh, with a drop of blood and tell what you were. I think you had some of the biggest uh, business names on that board um, and uh, didn't really help them. So uh, I think yeah, it's absolutely. an interesting. Yeah. And you make a good point because again, when you look at really, you know, the sense of staying true to the identity or aligning of the identity and the vision, it is those board members who have been behind or very much involved and hands on the ones that really understand what the essence of that business is and their loyalty lies in really pushing it forward. So it's always about balancing it, right? I think just getting the right mix so that you can eliminate uh, the, the the emotional side of things and the conflicts and really being able to just then work with a much more effective uh, setup and board structure. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, one of the interesting things is you know, who are we as a company? And I find all my clients now are coming to me and, you know, they're real estate developers and they're saying, no, we're, we're a tech company or we're, we're a software company. And it doesn't matter really who you are. Everybody wants to be, you know, sexy tech, uh, you know, the next Zuckerberg or whatnot. Unfortunately, obviously I missed that boat uh, dramatically, but um, you know, some of my board, board my boards in, in the hotel business, you know, one board member says, you know, hey, uh, you know, we're actually a real estate developer. Our real strength is picking great locations and building, you know, iconic uh, properties that people want to stay in. And, you know, the next board member says, no, you know, we're really a, a, a hotel management company. And our strength is training people, developing uh, people to deliver that service better than anyone else in this in this region. And, you know, then the third guy pipes up and says, no, you know, we're a tech company and, you know, our strength is really driving digital revenue and our ability to fill a hotel uh, with our online booking system is really the way we need to go. And so you have all three of them and all three of these guys are in the exact same business, but totally different perspectives. Um, do you feel uh, this identity is becoming a growing issue as we kind of uh, mature into, you know, the unknown of what's going to happen now in the next few years? Well, definitely, I agree with you, and that's something we observe as well. And perhaps this goes back to suggesting that you know, if you do, if if each board member thinks about the identity differently, then it's going to be very hard to really be able to draw out your strategic mapping and even execute on it. And but it is not uncommon, right? So what I'm saying, you're right. It's not uncommon because, you know, when I sit with boards discussing an opportunity or a strategy. I, I definitely hear the different perspectives and, you know, it's as if everyone has his own agenda or interest. And that's what I think also is not uncommon on boards where you have either your different perspectives or your different interests. I mean, to some extent, it is the ego that goes into being associated with certain projects. So, but that, the, the chances of succeeding with such, you know, a disconnected and dysfunctional board is minimal, right? So the idea here is that we definitely need to align. One thing for sure, I mean, and also in recognizing the times that we operate in, agility becomes even more important, right? We all talk about being flexible and agile, which somehow to the point that was discussed earlier on, I mean, you know, there are your teams and CEOs that need to be pretty much up to date with what's happening, but on a very strategic board level, you need to remain focused until such point in time when there is no harm in going back and reassessing the identity of the company but that's not something that is expected to happen overnight or within a year or even two where i often find concerns is that many of the ideas and those attributing to certain identities or identifying what we want to become is not necessarily based on well-grounded data-driven research analysis it is more around actually you know a friend business partner, they've done that, they've succeeded, perhaps there's an idea. And I relate it back all to the hospitality industry. And just to give a very simple example, because another individual or firm were able to roll out an operating company, we should all be able to roll out an operating company. Why can't we? Well, I mean, there's just so much that needs to go into making that decision to become an operating company, right? Versus being a holding company with different brands. So there are opportunities and opportunities that might look sexier and better and quicker, but I think it's also extremely true 
that you remain focused on the identity. I mean, one of the examples that I use as a, and I hope there are no operators on this call, but I challenge them, is that once upon a time, the big international brands were selling service, brand, exclusivity, personalized service. Today, they sit and pitch that they have the best booking platform. So suddenly, instead of delivering on a promise, you are now basically saying we're better than booking.com or Expedia. Are you really? So there is also some harm with actually changing the narrative uh, to your point, Shane. But alignment amongst board members on that is extremely important. That's why I think, you know, when we discuss about the right mix, there ought to be a very uh, clear uh, expectations of what board members are signing up to and believing and supporting the vision so that everyone remains focused in, in, in somehow what is similar interests for the company. So let me turn it over to the audience here. Now we have uh, Mr. Amr Badruddin uh, with a question uh, for you. Amr, are you still here? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Hello, Mr. Yeah, Fani. How are you today? Yeah, thank uh, you. I'm really interested as a you being a subject matter and expert subject matter, is green uh, investment appealing to the family groups? And how can we accelerate the conversation from climate financing to green financing, which seems to be more appealing to investment as green investments are in the category of safe, secure. So, and do you think this will mitigate the gap uh, that is current uh, in order to reach the 2030 SDG uh, uh, goals? Great. So there were a couple of questions here. I'll try to address them one at a time. You can remind me. But the very first yeah. question was more around the greenfield projects versus existing, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, it really depends on the market cycle, market opportunity. So we, we see in Saudi Arabia, for example, the by far the majority is greenfield projects or to some extent brownfield. And therefore, the investment is much more focused there, whereas in the UAE, because of the maturity of the market, it is now perhaps more around acquisitions. With that said, I mean, if we look at some of the big funds, when they look to solidify their uh, their portfolio or increase their value, what they went, what they did, they did acquire either existing companies um, related to the hospital space or acquired hotels. So the preference then would be for income generating assets versus greenfield. So it is not a, a, the most favored approach green uh, in uh, income generating assets. So it really depends on market cycle. The next question was around financing, was it? Around uh, yes, like uh, how do we accelerate it from climate financing to green financing, green infrastructures like green bonds and because this seems to be more appealing to investment as the vocabulary in climate financing, financing is yeah. like, it's not, uh, I'll, I'll it's be not very reaching. I'll be transparent with you. I mean, I wouldn't be able to comment at length at this. I know that between the traditional financing model and all the other new derivatives, uh, this by far is not yet in practice. I mean, it sounds like the right thing. It sounds like if you were to invest in, uh, sustainable uh, practices that you will have better preferential rates. But in reality, there isn't enough evidence to suggest that this has now overtaken. For most part of it, it is still very much traditional financing. In, in Europe, for example, versus here, there is much more debt financing that goes into these projects, whereas in this part of the world, perhaps there's more equity financing. And that's where it's, it's quite different. But uh, uh, yes, there is much more sophisticated financing coming into play. Uh, not so much yet to be fair relevant in the hospitality industry. It may be applicable more in other industries than ours at this stage. Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So let's just get la one last question. I don't know if Mr. Kuhn, uh, Yunus, I don't know how to say his name properly. Am I saying that correct? Kuhn, Yunus, Yunus, right? Is that right? I don't think he's here. Okay, maybe he's gone. Okay, well, uh, that is uh, Rob, Thank you so much. Oh, I mean, I, th I find it uh, really exciting uh, uh, industry because uh, obviously I'm a user of the product, and you can uh, see how it how it has really evolved. Uh, and today, I think our selection of hotels 
is probably best in the world. Some of the, I mean, what's your opinion? How do we rank? Do you think, where does Dubai rank in terms of? Absolutely. They raised the bar so high. It's made it very difficult to be to very, very, you know, genuinely, they've raised the bar. I think um, the expectation is only becoming even uh, uh, higher. I mean, oftentimes when we look at the Saudi traveler, uh, it's they're well traveled now. They're quite sophisticated. They've been to Dubai. So even delivering in their home, which is Saudi, is another level altogether. It's like, how can you top what they already have experienced and know? But it is exciting, very exciting uh, um, industry. Perhaps the one thing, just tying it back to the board discussion that we were having, Shane, it is one of those industries that, although it's real estate naturally, but once you've built it, it is an income producing asset in the sense that oftentimes where we're seeing some of the incoming boards today are having to inherit some of the bad investments that were made. I mean, this is very capital intensive industry and quite seasonal. It's not mainstream. And as exciting as it is, I mean, it does require good expertise to be able to govern uh, the growth strategies for those groups. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it, it is uh, interesting. What would you say the historic uh, champion for the hotel industry was? Was it New York City was kind of the top dog in the in the global community or? It was. I mean, definitely we had uh, New York, we had uh, London, and more recently we see Dubai up there, which is great. I mean, it's fantastic. You know, when you look at the region and solid performance of it or Dubai is definitely making it in the amongst the top uh, five, which uh, again is a good testament to what has been done in the last. Thanks, 15. thanks to professionals like you uh, churning out all this great work, and thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, sharing your insights. I guess we'll we'll have to catch you hopefully at one of the five star uh, luxury hotels. I'm sure as you as you are sitting there advising your clients on what to do next to uh, just out uh, the competition. Um, and for anybody who wants to follow up with uh, Ms. Hala, you can reach her on uh, LinkedIn, I believe, right, is the best way for them to reach out to you. Right. Um, so great. Thank you so much for sharing your time. And uh, we appreciate it. And thanks so much for all of uh, our guests who have come. And a big thanks to Hakama, the Institute of Governance, our partner for the event, um, who's uh, really kind of the leader in terms of any kind of training certification uh, that you would want for uh, any of the uh, board members out there. And um, it's really a pleasure being part of it. And again, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just a caveat that I have been capped because I have over 30,000 contacts on LinkedIn, so I can't connect with anyone. So I just have to follow you. So if I'm not connecting, don't take it uh, personally. Thank you so much. And well, Thank that, you for please. having me. And thank you for all the participants. Have a good evening. Okay, masalama. Bye for now. Goodbye.